Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Last time we stopped with the plan of Quraysh and its allies to attack the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Initially, some of the leaders of Ghatafan uh, didn't want to go. So Ghatafan was divided. Their big leader, Uyayna uh, uh, ibn Hizn al-Fazari, he was the leader of Ghatafan. He wanted to ally with Quraysh and fight the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Al-Harith ibn Awf, another leader of Ghatafan, did not want to. He said, we haven't seen anything bad from this man. Why declare war against him? He hasn't attacked us. We are sort of a neutral terms. We're not his friends, but we're not his enemies. So why earn his hatred and his enmity? We have seen what happened to other tribes that fought him. Even Quraysh itself was defeated completely in Badr and partially defeated in Uhud. So why subject ourselves to this added pressure? But Uyayn ibn Hisn kept on insisting on him and pressuring him until in the end he, he went with that army reluctantly. Again, remember Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, one of the leaders of, of Quraysh, he didn't want to fight the Prophet وسلم, in Badr, but after uh, Abu Jahl insulted him and kept pressuring him, he reluctantly went and he became one of the leaders of that army and one of the very few to be killed at the very beginning of that battle as a non-believer. So the same thing happened to Al-Harith ibn Awf. Now Quraysh and its allies went from Mecca all the way north to camp to the north of Medina. And now Huyay ibn Akhtab is sending his communication to Bani Quraydah. The leader of Bani Quraydah, Ka'b ibn Asad, he didn't want anything to do with Huyay ibn Akhtab. He said, you are bad news. You are a bad omen. Shu'b. You are the bringer of bad luck. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to listen to you. I have seen what you have brought to your people. You were in peace with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until you decided that you wanted to get rid of him. Why? What did he do to you? He was peaceful to you, he was kind to you, and you wanted to kill him. So I'm not going to listen to you. But Huyay ibn Akhtab was a very persuasive man. He tried different ways to persuade Ka'b ibn Asad and change his mind. In the end, Ka'b ibn Asad did not want to open the gates of the fortresses of Bani Quraida for Huyay ibn Akhtab until Huyay told him, listen, you don't want to open the gates because you have cooked some food that you know I like and you don't want to share it with me. You are a bad man. You are a, a stingy man. And he kept insulting him. So in the end, Ka'b ibn Asad opened the fortress to Huyay ibn Akhtab and said, well, now here you are. Tell me what you want. And he said, I brought with me a huge army. I brought Quraysh with all of its might, with all of its strength. I brought Ghatafan with all of its power. I brought Hawazin with all of its power. I brought my own people from Bani Nadir who want to get their revenge from the Prophet ﷺ. So I have a huge army. This is going to be our chance. And Ka'b ibn Asad said, and why should I fight Muhammad? He has never betrayed me, has never been uh, anything but kind and fair to me. And he still kept talking to him left and right, and he was very persuasive until in the end, <clears throat> Ka'b ibn Asad changed his mind and said, all right, if you promise me that this is going to be a complete and final victory, I am willing to align with you. What happened to the Prophet ﷺ being kind to me, being generous to me? What, uh, what happened to your promise that you gave to the Prophet ﷺ? Again, he forgot all of that and reneged on all of that. Now, the Prophet وسلم, knew the attempts of Huyay ibn Akhtab and he knew that if Bani Quraida betrays them, that is going to put them in a very hard situation because they are going to be completely surrounded from north and from south. So what to do? The Prophet وسلم, wanted to send a messenger to check What's going on in the village of Bani Quraida? So he, said, he asked initially, who would be willing to go and get me the news from Bani Quraida? And his cousin 
سيدنا الزبير بن العوام رضي الله عنه سيدنا الزبير بن العوام is the son of صفية بنت عبد المطلب the aunt of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم the paternal aunt of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he was a very close companion to the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so سيدنا الزبير رضي الله عنه said I am willing and the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم repeated maybe someone else but Sayyidina Zubair said, I am willing three times. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, okay, you go as Zubair. Every Prophet has a disciple, a very close companion, and you are my disciple. So Sayyidina Zubair radiallahu anhu traveled to the village of Bani Quraidah, which again is to the south of Medina. And when he went there, he found that the treaty that was written, the treaty of Medina, the mutual defense, cooperation, collaboration, mutual support, etc., that was signed by the Prophet ﷺ and the leaders of the three Jewish tribes, he found that they took this piece of uh, leather or, or parchment or whatever, and they tore it apart, which means that we don't have any agreement with you anymore. So he went back to the Prophet ﷺ saying that, I have seen the agreement torn into pieces. I don't know whether this means treason or what, what exactly does it mean. So the Prophet ﷺ said, well, Zubair, you're a great companion, but you are an immigrant. You're not originally from here. Let me send someone who can really talk to them, someone who really knows them, and they know and they trust. So the Prophet ﷺ sent the two leaders. The leader of Al-Aws, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu and the leader of Al-Khazraj Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu so that no one can find any excuse that we are allied with this tribe or we are allied with that tribe so he sent both leaders and he gave them some instructions he told them listen I want you to go and talk to the leaders of Bani Quraidah and come back with the news if the news are positive or are good which means that Bani Quraida are still holding tight to our agreement, say it loudly so that all the believers would feel comfort and would feel strong trust and that we have not been betrayed. On the other hand, if you find that we have been betrayed, if you find that they decided to end this agreement, do not say it loudly. Give it to me by code. Give it to me in a way that I can understand, but not everyone would understand. So do not say it loudly. They went to Bani Quraidah, and Bani Quraidah knew them, respected them. So when they saw them, some of the people of Bani Quraidah started insulting the Prophet ﷺ and insulting his companions. And Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad and Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Ubadah said, why are you doing that? You haven't seen anything but good treatment from us. Why have you decided to betray us? And they said, well, this is it. We are going to ally ourselves with the other uh, factions and with the other armies that are coming and we're going to fight you. And they kept trying to convince them not to break that treaty and not to betray the Prophet ﷺ, but they insist on that. And they started insulting uh, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions and Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu started insulting them back. He started cursing them back, re re repeating the same words, but now directed to them. Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu anhu told him, calm down. What's between us and them now is greater than insults. This is treason. This is high treason. So they brought it upon themselves. If we defeat them, they're going to be killed. This is the punishment for high treason. Today, even, if there's an army and there's a, a mutiny within the army at time of war or, or if there are deserters in that army at the time of war, usually there's a court-martial and usually these traitors are executed. So that was the norm for the rules of war at that time and even until this time. They went back now with the bad news to the Prophet ﷺ. Remember what the Prophet ﷺ told them? If it's bad news, do not say it out loud. Just give me a code. So when they came back and the Prophet ﷺ saw them coming, he asked, what is it? 
and they said Adal wal Qarra. What does that mean? Remember in Yawm al Raji'ah, in the betrayal of the tribes that betrayed the Prophet وسلم, and killed his companions, it was these two tribes, Adal wal Qarra. And, and then in the other treason, there was Ra'al and the Quan and Bani Amr and part of Bani Amr and so on. So now saying Adal wal Qarra means that they betrayed us as Adal wal Qarra had betrayed our brothers uh, last year or two years ago. And the Prophet وسلم, got the message. He understood that code. Those who were sitting around did not really pay attention. What do they mean by that? They're just mentioning the names of two Arab tribes. What does that mean? They didn't even know the mission on which Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Mu'ad and Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Ubadah were sent. They did not know the details of that mission. They didn't know that they went to talk to the leaders of Bani Quraidah. And therefore, when, when they mentioned these two names of the two tribes, no one really guessed what are they talking about. But the Prophet Sallallahu got the message and he really understood what's going on. So now again, it's a very tight situation. The Prophet Sallallahu wanted to break the unity of these armies at any price. So he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came up with the idea. Let's send a messenger to, Ghataf to uh, Ghatafan. What brought Ghatafan in the first place? We did not have a war with them. Maybe we can buy their allegiance. Maybe if we agree with them that if they return back to their villages without fighting, we can give them one third of the annual crop of dates of Medina. The dates of Medina were the best dates, different kinds of dates. So if we agree that we're going to give them one third of the annual crop of the dates of Medina, if they agree to that and they go back, now we have managed at least to, to remove one third of that force that's allied against us. And then we can deal with the other two thirds one way or another. So the Prophet ﷺ sent someone that he could trust. <clears throat> he sent Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. That was the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He sent them with this message. Go and talk to Uyayna ibn, Hifz, uh, ibn Hizd and to Al-Harith ibn Awf. Try to talk sense into them. Tell them what brought you from your village. Is it money? Is it food? We're going to give you food. We're going to give you supplies. These dates that you used to buy from us at a high price, we are willing to give you one third of the crop of Medina on one condition that you return back and not fight us. Now, <coughs> the leaders of Ghatafan, upon hearing that, they said, you know what? That's not a bad idea. So instead of subjecting ourselves to a risk of facing an army and maybe some of our leaders, some of our youth get killed, now we're going to go back, not only safely, but we're going to go back with supplies for the whole year, which is one third of the crop of Medina. They said, this is a very good deal. Let's, let's accept that deal. So they said, it's a deal. We accept your proposal. And basically the Prophet ﷺ called for someone to write the, the details of this deal. This is the agreement between the Prophet ﷺ and the leaders of Ghatafan that if you go back, you're going to get this and that. And when they wrote, they wrote the terms of that deal, but before signing it, the Prophet was about to basically put his seal on that deal, which means that his approval then came Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Mu'ad and Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Ubaidah, the leaders of, of Medina, the former leaders of Medina, leaders of Aws and Khazraj. And they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very politely and very calmly, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is this something that you're doing for us to protect us from this tribe? Or is it something that you love to do, so we're going to follow your order? Or is it something that has been revealed to you but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we're going to accept it without any, without any negotiation? So is it one of these three? If you're doing it for us to protect us, we don't want this protection. 
If you're doing it for our sake, no, we don't want that. If, you, if it's something that you want and you like, we're going to do it. We might not like it, but if you like it, we're going to do it. If it has been revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then definitely we're going to do it. And the Prophet sallallahu said, actually, it's the former one, it's the first one. It's something that I wanted to do for you. I don't really care about Atafan, I don't like them. I don't want to give them, but I wanted to break the unity of these confederates and these armies. So Sayyidina Sa'd ibn Mu'ad told the Prophet sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, before you came to us with Islam, Ghatafan would not dare eat one date from Medina except if it was in hospitality. They came as guests and we showed them hospitality. So we gave them these dates as a gift or they would buy it from us at the price that we set. That was when we were in ignorance before Islam. Now that we have become Muslims and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored us with Islam, they are going to take our crops despite our will, that would never happen. So if it's something that you wanted to do for us, no, we don't want that. What's between us and them is the sword. If they came as fighters and as attackers, we are going to fight them. And the Prophet ﷺ called for that piece of leather or parchment on which the agreement was written. And he said to the leaders of Atafan, you have heard what the leaders of Medina are saying. And he tore it apart ﷺ and said, well, if you came as enemies, you have one of two options. Either go back, we're going to allow you safe passage and going back to your villages. Or if you want to insist on fighting us, we are going to fight you. So now, again, the unity of Quraysh has been confirmed. Quraysh, Atafan, Hawazin, uh, the Jews of Khaybar, the Jews of Bani Nadir, and now the Jews of Bani, Qayn, of Bani Quraydah, all of them are allied against the Prophet Now, this battle happened in the winter months. If anyone has been to Medina, you know Mecca, uh, with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hot year round so in December or in January it's warm in June and July it's, it's, it's extremely hot and maybe Allahu A'lam يعني, since uh, the Muslims who go for pilgrimage or for Umrah they're wearing the ihram which doesn't cover much uh, they're going to be exposed to the elements so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it warm year round Medina on the other hand in winter, it can get really cold, especially during the month of January, February, and so on. At night, especially, it gets really cold, bitter cold, the cold of the desert. So now, that was around that time in these winter months. The Muslims are surrounded from all sides. What are they going to do? So the Prophet wasallam asked them, what would you think we should do? Should we stay in Medina and defend it? Remember the, the question that the Prophet ﷺ asked at Uhud. <clears throat> and that was the option that he ﷺ wanted to follow, staying in Medina and defending Medina. All the people of Medina can become soldiers, even the women and the children that can, they can throw rocks or whatever against the enemy. And Abdullah ibn Ubay had the same opinion. So now Abdullah ibn Ubay said, of course, yes, we can defend Medina. Let's not venture out of Medina. And we have seen what happened when we ventured out of Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, should we stay in Medina and defend it? And Abdullah ibn Ubay said, yes, but it's going to take time. We need at least a couple of months to build our fortresses in Medina and so on. There's no time. The army is there already. So Abdullah ibn Ubay was giving a sort of a hypothetical uh, answer because we do not have the luxury of time of preparing our defenses and our fortresses and preparing the rocks that the, the kids are going to throw at the enemy that's going to take a couple of months the enemy is already here so the Prophet ﷺ said or should we and this is very interesting uh, suggestion very unique very uncommon or should we dig a trench to separate us from our enemy now, this is according to one of the narrations. And as soon as the Prophet ﷺ said this word, a trench, it triggered 
uh, the light bulb in the mind of one of his recent companions, عنهم, Sayyidina Salman al-Farisi. We talked before about the journey of faith of Sayyidina Salman, how he left his safe village in Persia where his father was the caretaker of the holy fire and he, he became, he followed faith wherever it took him. It took him to Iraq, it took him to Asham, it took him until he heard about the, 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 the time of the Prophet وسلم, in Medina and he traveled to Medina and he was taken as a slave and he was enslaved in Medina until the Prophet وسلم, migrated and when he saw him, as soon as he saw him he recognized this is the Prophet that I was told about so he followed the Prophet وسلم. so that triggered the idea in the mind of Sayyidina Salman that brings back old memories he told the Prophet وسلم, that's it in our villages in Faris in Persia Whenever we were surrounded by a strong enemy, we used to dig a trench around our village, a relatively wide and deep trench that would prevent the cavalry of the enemy from crossing and attacking us in our village. And that proved to be a very good defense. We've tried it before. I know how to do it. I know what it's going to take. So let's go ahead and do that. That was a confirmation of an opinion, according to many narrations, of an opinion of the Prophet ﷺ that Sayyidina Salman again took the idea or the glimpse of the idea from the Prophet ﷺ and he built his whole plan and he showed the companions this is what it's going to take. Let's divide ourselves into team and let's assign a certain portion of that trench. The, le the trench should be that wide, it should be that deep and it should be that long to surround Medina from these weak points. There are some other points where we have mountains or uh, uh, farms or something like that that's, that are going to act as a natural barrier but in the areas that are exposed plain and exposed this is where we should dig our trench so in fact it's going to be two trenches one to the north where Quraysh and its allies are and maybe one to the south to prevent betrayal from the back from Bani Quraidah who have already declared their treason so what, is the, what, what was the amount of excavation that we're talking about? First of all, the kind of, of soil surrounding Medina, in some areas, it is rocky. We have the mountain of Uhud, for example, or Salah, and, and, and so on. So these are uh, rocks. And then in some areas, it's clay or fertile soil for the, for the farms where they plant their crops and so on. But the area where the enemy is coming, it has a mix, but mostly rocky soil. Not completely rock, but it, it has some big boulders. So we need a lot of work. How big is the trench? We're talking here about, according to some narrations, it would be about four miles long and about 20 feet wide to prevent a horse from jumping from one side to another. And about maybe eight feet deep. You just do the math. Today, if you ask a construction company to dig a trench that is four miles long, 20 feet wide, eight feet deep, they're going to tell you, well, with the modern equipment that we have, it's going to take probably two to three weeks with all the excavators and the loaders and all the heavy equipment that we have is going to take probably two to three weeks. Well, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, accomplished that feat in six days. Six days digging with their hands, digging with picks and, and axes and manual tools and manual labor. That is the equipment that they had. And the Prophet ﷺ came up with the idea of dividing them into teams. What would be a better way than to have a competition? So we have Muhajireen, we have the Ansar. Among the Ansar we have Aus, we have Khazraj. Let's have a competition. Let this family, let Bani Abdul Ashhal, for example, from the Aus, have their own crew. Let uh, uh, Bani Zuhra have their own crew. Let Bani Najjar have their own crew. Let this group have uh, their own crew. Let the Muhajireen, and if the Muhajireen want to divide themselves into crews of maybe six to ten people, and this is the daily allotment for each crew to dig every day. 
Sayyidina Salman radiallahu anhu was an expert. He knew what it would take and he knew how to tackle the soil and how to achieve high productivity. So now the Muhajireen wanted to claim Sayyidina Salman to be one of them. They wanted to win him on their team. You know, when we were young, when they were choosing, for example, soccer teams or something, the two captains would look for the best players to join their team. So the Muhajireen said, well, Salman, come and join us. You're one of us. And the Ansar said, no, 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 no. Salman, you've been living here in Medina. Come and join us. You're one of us. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, 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 no. Salman is one of us, the household of the Prophet ﷺ. Salman minna ahl al-bayt, which is the highest, the highest honor. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, this is one of my close family now. And they started digging and to help with the digging, they started chanting, and the Prophet ﷺ chanting with them, Wallahi lawlallahu mahtadayna wa la tasaddaqna wa la sallayna. We swear by Allah, were it not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his guidance, we wouldn't have been guided, we would not have given charity, nor have we prayed. فَأَنزِلًا سَكِينَةً عَلَيْنَا وَتَبِّتْ الْأَقْدَامَ إِذْ لَا قَيْنْ لَا قَيْنَا O Allah, shower us with your calm and comfort and make our feet steady when we, may, when we meet our enemy. And the Prophet وسلم, seeing how hard they were working, would say, صلى الله عليه وسلم, اللهم إن العيش عيش الآخرة فاغفر للأنصار والمهاجرة O Allah, the real life is the life of the hereafter. O oh Allah, forgive the Ansar and the Muhajireen. And they would chant to, again, forget the exhaustion and the fear and the cold. They would try to do anything to distract themselves and to do that hard work as best as they could. Now, during the, the excavation of the trench, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to send message uh, messages actually, messages of confirmation, messages of you're fine, you're on the right path. So now one companion came to the Prophet وسلم, saying, Ya Rasulullah, I'm so hungry, I'm so weak, I'm so cold, I'm so hungry. The hunger, I haven't eaten anything from maybe three days and the hunger is hurting me, I have tied a stone over my stomach to compress it so that I don't feel hunger. And he exposed his belly to show the Prophet ﷺ that he has tied a stone on his stomach. The Prophet ﷺ, upon seeing that told him, come, let me show you. And the Prophet ﷺ exposed his own stomach. He had three stones on his stomach. He had even more hunger than anyone else because he ﷺ, worked more than anyone else. He did not just supervise and say, you do this, you do that, and he sat in comfort. No, the Prophet ﷺ was the first one to do the work to show his companions what to do. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.